Hello, my name is Kim Eagle. I'm the editor of ACC.org from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Delighted to bring you clinical trials from day three of the American Heart Association. I'm joined today by Dr. Pyle Coley from Colorado and Dr. Deepak Bhatt from Boston. You know, I love trial names. They're just fantastic. Cardiologists are so good at picking uh, names that, that really enjoy, right? So let's talk about Prepare It too. Yeah, I love this name as well because it helps us to prepare for COVID-19. That's how I remember it. So this is a trial looking at icosapent ethyl versus placebo in outpatients with COVID to try to ask the question whether it reduces hospitalizations or COVID-related mortality. And it really comes from the fact that Dr. Bott and others have published data already that um, icosapent ethyl reduces inflammation, reduces CRP, and may actually have a beneficial effect when given early in the course of COVID, uh, particularly before that inflammatory phase really starts to kick in. So this trial gave patients um, three days of eight grams of IPE, followed by um, you know, up to 28 days of four grams of IPE, and they had to have PCR confirmed COVID. And it was outpatients only who were not sick enough to get into the hospital, about 2,000 patients. And what we saw is that the primary endpoint of hospitalizations and mortality at 21 days was reduced numerically, but this did not hit statistical significance. So it really begs the question of whether for a 28 day trial, which is kind of an early endpoint, was this a large enough study to detect a difference? And do we need larger studies here? I'm excited about having something else in our armamentarium, especially with the good safety profile of IPE. But what are your thoughts, Kim and Deepak? Well, I agree with you. I think that the trial size uh, limited the ability to show the endpoint. Um, and I guess, Deepak, the question to you is, is a larger trial being entertained? Uh, and if so, might, might when that start? Yeah, no, really terrific question. You know, this was, I, I, I chaired the study. It was designed as a pilot all along. That is, we knew it was going to be underpowered. And we just wanted to see, you know, is there a merit in pursuing a larger trial? And, you know, it certainly, uh, like Paul said, looks really safe here, even with that loading dose that was used of the Icosa pentethyl. And uh, there are signals here of benefit. I mean, it's not statistically significant. I wouldn't endorse its clinical use right now for COVID outpatients, but you know, the hazard ratio of 0.78 for a COVID-19 hospitalization or death. And you know, the number of ischemic events was uh, you know, too few, but four versus 11 uh, in favor of icosapentethyl, even total mortality, you know, four versus eight, uh, uh, again, way underpowered, but everything heading in the right direction. So yeah. I, I think the pandemic's still ongoing. Um, this would be in the context of 28-day therapy, a relatively inexpensive, safe therapy that could be deployed globally, including in resource-constrained portions of the world. So I think a large trial should be done. Uh, will it be done? Um, you know, right now, uh, the, the company that uh, sponsored this trial isn't interested in doing a larger trial, but I'm hoping maybe the NIH or Oxford or one of these other large trial networks will say, okay, yeah, this has already been de-risked in terms of patient safety. Uh, it looks like there's some positive signals here. Let's do a proper, you know, eight, 10,000 patient powered trial and see if this is the real deal for COVID. Perfect. Yeah, I love it when we see uh, early reports of novel agents uh, in the cardiovascular space and axiomatic TKR is a trial that, that might be introducing us to a whole new range of possibilities. Deepak, tell our audience about this particular trial. Sure, so a lot of scientific excitement as well here. As you mentioned, the drug's name is Melvexian, but this is a factor 11A inhibitor, just so that people know. So this is a new class of investigational agents. Uh, Melvexian is one drug, but there are other drugs in the class being tested. In fact, it looks like Milvexian is about to launch a large uh, outcome trial or series of outcome trials in a variety of different disease states where uh, thrombosis is important. But what this was, was specifically examining Milvexian in about 1,200 or so patients undergoing knee arthroplasty, so orthopedic surgery. And different doses of uh, Milvexian were tested against enoxaparin. The primary endpoint was looking at uh, venous thromboembolic type endpoints and obviously looking at bleeding. And from a bottom line perspective, the drug looked really good. Uh, the bleeding profile uh, was really quite favorable, didn't seem any worse than enoxaparin as far as really bad bleeding goes. 
Uh, and as far as the efficacy goes, again, it looked to be at least as good as uh, anoxaparin. Uh, there was a nice dose response relationship and the best doses or the, uh, the higher doses, uh, it looked like in fact, lower rates of, of venous thrombosis than with anoxaparin. So overall to me, it seemed like this is a very promising uh, and in this context, highly efficacious and safe therapy. And I think bodes well, not only for this potential indication for the drug, but what will probably be a very large program studying it in multiple different indications. For sure. Uh, I was really impressed with the reduction endpoints at those higher doses. Pyle, did you have any comments about this particular study? You know, I was just going to add that uh, venous thromboembolism after elective surgery is really a problem. I mean, just last week in clinic, I had a patient who got a prox LAD stent, did great with it. I sent him for his knee replacement, and he got put on BID aspirin as a prophylactic from his orthopedic surgeon and ended up having a large occlusive thrombus. So as Deepak says, I think having a new class of medications, perhaps one that you know, may even have a better safety profile, uh, less than 20% renal clearance for this class. So we could potentially use it more safely in our patients with renal disease. It's really very exciting to see the potential for this class of medications. I totally agree. There's another uh, study being presented today, which is a substudy look of ASCEND looking at the low dose aspirin use as it relates to dementia. Um, and this is a really important uh, topic Pyle, what are your thoughts? Yes, a very important question, um, Kim, and also a lot of interest in aspirin, especially with the recent update of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force to their guidelines on prophylactic aspirin. So this really asks the question of whether low-dose aspirin 100 milligrams affected dementia outcomes in patients with diabetes, but without known dementia, essentially looking at, you know, their vascular risk being higher, and small vessel ischemic risk being higher, whether this would prophylax them against dementia. So a large study, over 15,000 patients uh, randomized to low-dose aspirin versus placebo uh, diabetics. And, and followed for 7.4 years within the trial and then 1.8 years afterwards. And what we saw is that, of course, these patients had a higher dementia risk. Uh, they had a higher risk of vascular events. But unfortunately, the low-dose aspirin did not offer any statistically significant effect on whether it was uh, narrow dementia outcomes or broad dementia outcomes, as well as cognitive scoring. So to me, it begs the question of, you know, whether we needed more people to get dementia. Uh, the the follow-up was about 10 years, but do we even need a potentially longer follow-up with a larger sample size to detect differences. And then it also asks the question of this personalized decision-making approach that we need to shift towards in medicine. Not aspirin for everyone, not everything for everyone, but really understanding an individual risk and then determining what they're most likely to benefit from. Yeah, I agree with you. It's certainly, it's a large enough trial that if there was a large effect, I think we would have seen it. Uh, so uh, there, there may be questions, patients that we see that say imaging suggests maybe early vascular changes with diabetes where we're thinking uh, maybe this is a good therapy, but by and large, uh, the effect size would have to be uh, much larger than was shown in this trial to use this in kind of a, a common patient population with diabetes. Deepak, any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I agree with both with what both of you have said. And uh, just to remind everyone, the overall ascent trial for aspirin was positive. That is, it did show a significant reduction in ischemic events, modest in magnitude, somewhat matched by an increase in bleeding, but still uh, important ischemic events that were reduced. And aspirin does reduce the risk of ischemic stroke. So, you know, that could uh, tie into reductions in dementia. For sure, what we're seeing here, first of all, is a non significant result, but a, a modest effect, even if it were significant. But I do think a larger, longer term trial which I don't think anyone's planning, you know, might have shown, uh, in fact, statistical significance. But Pyle's right. I mean, you know, this isn't for everybody, but for carefully selected patients in the primary prevention diabetes universe, I think it's something to consider based on the trial overall being positive and these data that are at least provocative. Perfect. Let's finish with another novel agent uh, in the space of anticoagulation and, and, and treatment of bleeding. And that's a study called uh, uh, Reverse It. Uh, and you're very familiar with this trial, Deepak. 
Yeah, absolutely. So this is a trial looking at a ticagrelor reversal agent. Ticagrelor, of course, is an ADP receptor antagonist. Unlike clopidogrel or prasugrel in terms of its receptor binding, it's reversible. Those are irreversible agents. But the reversible doesn't mean it's reversible in a couple of minutes. It means it still takes about three days to get out of the system. Uh, but it, it is uh, reversible in as much as unlike clopidogrel and prasugrel, those drugs or their active metabolites bind to the platelet for the seven to 10 day lifespan of the platelet. So that reversible nature, uh, it matters, not just for board exams or, or, or that sort of thing, but, but here it ends up mattering because what has been possible is to develop a monoclonal antibody. In fact, it's a human monoclonal antibody fragment to be precise called ventrasimab. That binds with high affinity when given as a bolus and in infusion to ticagrelor, and for that matter, ticagrelor's active metabolite. And then that complex is removed from the circulation. But what that does, and I presented these data as a late breaker at ACC in 2019, and it was published in the New England Journal at the time, what that does is provide immediate and sustained reversal of ticagrelor's effect. Now, what I presented before was phase one data, which means healthy human volunteer data. What was presented here was the reverse trial, which is the phase three trial, uh, one designed in consultation with the US FDA and the European Medicines Agency, and also in consultation with them. What was presented here was an interim analysis, a pre-specified pre interim analysis of the phase three patients. And again, phase three means that these are actual patients, not healthy volunteers as before. And what we showed in this population was a quick, and significant and sustained reversal of ticagrelor's effect using a couple of different platelet assays, a highly significant, consistent, and for that matter, significant across multiple pre-specified subgroups. Beyond just looking at the platelets and a restoration of platelet function, we also looked at bleeding and looked at adjudicated rates of hemostasis. And uh, this was a single arm study. There's no uh, randomization here. We didn't feel it was uh, uh, feasible or ethical to to randomize you know, somebody that's got like an intracranial hemorrhage uh, to a placebo in this circumstance. But we had adjudicators uh, independently assessing whether they thought hemostasis was uh, obtained. So the investigators assessed, but, but the adjudicators assessed. And by the adjudicators assessment in the overall population studied, over 90% achieved either good or excellent hemostasis. So um, this study is uh, continuing. We enrolled a predominance of surgical patients and cardiac surgery at that to date, but we intend for the rest of the trial to focus on enrolling more bleeding patients. But even the bleeding patients we had here, the platelet reversal results were entirely consistent with the surgical patients, as you might hope and expect, uh, and even the hemostasis looked pretty good. Yeah, I think this is a potentially paradigm-changing therapeutic in that unique group of patients. I think there were just what eight patients in the bleeding category. Uh, uh, yes, at least you know per, it, it gets a little uh, tricky, per the enrolling physicians, they categorized eight of them as bleeding, but the adjudicators categorized some more as bleeding, ones that the uh, investigators had categorized as surgical. But you know, in many respects, surgery is a great model of controlled bleeding. Uh, but again, you know, we do plan to get a bunch more patients with things like intracranial hemorrhage and spontaneous bleeding from you know, the GI tract and other sources. So uh, more to come in that regard. But, you know, these interim results actually have been uh, accepted uh, for publication in the new journal called NEGM Evidence. That's New England Journal of Medicine's new journal. So, you know, the details of that uh, analysis will eventually be published there. Congratulations. Pyle, any comments about this trial? I would add a couple of things. The first, I was really happy to see there was no rebound effect on the platelets, which is something we all worry about, especially in our patients potentially awaiting cardiac surgery. But to really echo what Kim said, Deepa, congratulations on this, because I do think not only is it going to improve clinical care tremendously, but I also think the cost, the number of patients that I think about that have been parked waiting for their ticagrelor to wear off, waiting for, you know, cardiac surgery, I think it really is going to help us move the needle forward. Totally agree with you both. So four great trials discuss, discussed today on day three of the American Heart Association. I want to thank uh, Dr. Pyle Coley and Dr. Deepak Bhatt for very insightful comments about these uh, clinical trials that uh, we reported on today. Kim Eagle for ACC.org, and I'm out. <music>